right, hello everybody. This week we're talking about William James, who is our first American philosopher that we're getting. And we're also getting a lot more recent. He lived from 1842 to 1910. So we're getting a little bit more recent here. We're going to continue to get uh, a little bit more recent with Anna today. And obviously a lot has happened since the last philosopher we're going to talk about that we're just not going to have time to get to given the short constraints. But I highly recommend you read the extra couple of chapters in your textbook if you do want to learn more. So William James... Uh, also made a pretty big, pretty big waves in psychology, so he might be somebody that you have heard about. And Henry James, uh, a famous literature author and novelist, uh, was his brother, so you might have heard of him too. So one unique thing that James brought to the table in philosophy is uh, the, a different approach, a different way of looking at philosophy. And if you think back to the philosophers from the first half of the semester, like Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and Descartes and Kant, they were concerned with very big questions. They wanted a very big, generalized, universal answer that was clearly defined, that logically made sense, that was rational, all these other things. But then the last, there was a shift in philosophy, and the last several philosophers we've looked at have uh, looked at more specific day-to-day -day sorts of problems, whether it was uh, Kierkegaard and how we're supposed to live, what we're supposed to do, whether it was uh, Marx and what sort of political system should we have. Uh, we've seen sort of like this shift to more practical things. And James is going to be a big culminating point in that whole idea. He saw philosophy as a way to overcome despair and melancholy and problems as opposed to just sitting around thinking about weird things, which I'm not saying that's all philosophy was before then, but he saw it as a way to actually be able to fix some of the problems that people face and use it as a tool to help overcome and get past that. And despite his training in science and in psychology, he thought that philosophy was the right field to do this uh, because he said, that no other field has the patience and courage to continue to keep working out a problem for as long as philosophy does, right? Everybody else, science, psychology, whatever, would have bailed out a long time ago. And philosophers are still willing to keep working at these problems that philosophers have been working on for over 2,000 years. So, James's big thing here, and this is pretty much encompasses just about everything that your chapter has to say about him, uh, is pragmatism, which might be a term you've heard before. And pragmatism is really a way of looking at truth in terms of practicality. And it equates truth with usefulness. So the idea is to try to have a knowledge system that is as practical as possible. And practical, not just in the sense that it's easy to use, but that's part of it too, but practical in the sense that there's a cash value to statements. Not like you're literally going to get money from them, but in the sense that there's a direct payoff from these truths. <clears throat> so before we get into exactly how this is going to work, uh, your book gives you a distinction that uh, James makes between being tender and tough-minded. This is on 433, and you get a list here. So on the tender-minded side, we've got people who are optimistic and religious. They believe in free will. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, they're all about being rationalistic. Over on the tough-minded, we've got empiricists, people that go from Facts about the world, sensations, things that are material, they're pessimistic and fatalistic. We'll talk about that too. Uh, all these different categories. And James says that one of the problems here with the history of philosophy up until this point is that it deals in extremes. Pretty much everybody is on one side of the extreme or the other. So you've got somebody like Kant. Think back to the Kant-Mill distinction. <coughs> Sorry, I have a little cold. So Kant is all about your intention, your motivation, and being as rational as possible all the time. And John Stuart Mill was all about the outcome, what happens, and making everybody happy all the time. Right? You have two different extremes. So James thinks that philosophers have tended to operate within one of these extremes. 
And what happens is the majority of people do not operate within these extremes. We're a mix of the two, right? So you can maybe look at the list and kind of see what you would identify yourself as. And you're probably going to have a pretty good mix. And you might not even be all in with any one of those ideas or components. So if philosophy is only giving us the extremes and the majority of the world, people are not on either side completely, then you end up kind of selling some of yourself short and you end up kind of buying into something that doesn't really fit with the way that you look at the world and the way that your real life actually operates. And part of the reasons for the extremes here is because a lot of it's all about being logically consistent. So philosophers will come up with this huge entire worldview and then every little thing has to fit within that and be logically consistent. You can't make exceptions and all that other kind of stuff. So when you do that, you end up with something that's going to be pretty extreme and there's going to be consequences from it that maybe you're not going to like. So James is going to say that philosophy is something that has not been practical for a lot of people because it does operate in these extreme ways of thinking and it doesn't allow for the complexity and the gray area that actually exists for a lot of people. Now, you don't have to agree with him with this criticism of philosophy, but what he is going to offer us is a much different way of using philosophy. So the next thing we have is the will to believe, which... It's not really a good term for this, and James realized that after the fact, but that's what your book calls it, and that's what he called it originally. So, the will to believe is uh, something that should have been called the right to believe, but basically it's this idea that we have to choose what we believe about everything. Because even if you choose, I don't really care about that, that's still a choice. So basically, anytime we find out about any new piece of information, any new dilemma, any problem, any controversy, anything, we are forced to weigh in with our opinion. Now, you don't have to vocalize it, but for us personally, we have to make a decision on how we feel about this. So as soon as you find out about the government using drones, you have to form an opinion on it. Do you think that's a good idea? Do you think that's a bad idea? Do you think it's maybe somewhere in the middle? Do you just not care? Right? All of those are choices. All of those are beliefs. Now, typically when people, and I've probably used the term belief a lot here in this term, a lot of times when we hear belief, we think like a religious belief or something. But in philosophy, a belief is just any idea that you have. So we have to formulate these ideas. We have to formulate these opinions. And we have to choose. We can't just be completely neutral. The only way that we could be is if it's something that we've absolutely never heard of before. Now, with pragmatism, pragmatism is going to help make our forced choices a lot easier to make. Because instead of thinking about all of the consequences, instead of thinking about these huge moral rules, instead of worrying about being internally consistent and logical and rational with everything else we believe about the world, uh, we go for what has the practical payoff. So when we come across uh, an idea, a theory, a concept, a belief, whatever, we're supposed to ask ourselves, what practical difference would it make in my life if this was true versus something else? So let's take form, right? Think back to Plato versus Aristotle on form. Now, for Plato, form was some real, existing, never-changing, abstract, non-spatio-temporal thing that existed outside of the world but was very real. For Aristotle, form was just the shape of an object and what it looked like and we could change it. Now, if Plato was right that the way we should think about form is actually in this abstract sense, would that have a practical difference on your life? I mean, you might think a little bit differently, but is that really going to affect what you do day to day? The way that you interact with people, your, the way you perform your job and as a student? I mean, probably not, right? I mean, you might think about things a little differently, but it's probably not going to have a practical payout. Like, the people around you aren't going to be like, wow, you've been so different lately. You know, are you, are you on the platonic forms now? Right? That's probably not going to happen. <coughs> Same thing with Aristotle. If you view form as just the shape of an object, probably not going to have a dramatic impact on the way you live your life. 
So these sorts of philosophical questions to James don't have a practical payout. There's no cash value. Now, this doesn't mean that they're worthless and they're not worth thinking about, but what it does mean is maybe you don't stress out about it as much, right? So there are some things where there is a definite answer and we can prove it and you should believe it. So pragmatism doesn't say, oh, I just believe whatever you want about whatever it is, whatever you think is useful, right? And you can't walk around and be like, for me, 2 plus 2 equals 17 is useful, so I'm going to believe that, right? That would be irrational. So James is focused on using pragmatism in all of those debates where we don't know for sure, we can't prove which one it is. And that's a lot of things in philosophy, obviously, which is why this is uh, a philosophical theory. So if it's not going to make any practical difference to me, if I view form in the way that uh, Plato did versus the way that Aristotle did, then the whole thing is just kind of pointless and nonsense, and I don't really need to worry about it. Now, there are some things that actually will have a practical difference. So, if I view ethics as being the way that Mill thought it was, just about making people happy and making sure the outcome is good for everybody involved, versus Kant, who thought ethics was all about being internally fair and consistent and rational by applying the categorical imperative principle of dignity, act from the goodwill, all that stuff, that does make a practical difference. Because if I am like Kantian and live by what Kant thought, that is going to change the way I live my life. If I go all in with Mill and become a utilitarian, that is going to change the way I live my life. So those are the sorts of questions that we should be worrying about, according to James, because those are the ones that have that practical payout. Now, since we have to make a choice and we can't prove for sure which side is correct, here's how we make a choice. Pragmatism. And pragmatism tells us that whatever is true is what is useful, what's practical. So is it more useful for me to think of ethics in the way that Kant did or think of ethics in the way that Mill did? Now, there are some problems with pragmatism. Maybe that gives you sort of like a little bit of a, of a nod into exactly uh, what one of the problems would be. But let's talk about how he applies it to some other examples. Uh, I'm going to talk about religion, and then I think I'm going to do free will in the next video since we haven't really talked about free will yet. So, James wrote a book called The Varieties of Religious Experiences, which is a very popular book. It's a very big book, and it's all about the different types of experiences that people have within various religions in the world, and it's very, very interesting if you are interested in religion. So, what James thought was, if you look at the various religions in the world, they almost all have a very proactive deity deity being a god or goddess. So there aren't a lot of religions where you have a god or goddesses or whatever that like really just don't care and really don't do anything. Okay. They're, they're usually proactive deities that like get things done and are involved and whatever. And James thought that if people are atheists or do not believe in any sort of deities uh, or gods existence, uh, that it's probably because they don't think that God is doing anything for them. They don't see any practical payout to a belief in God. Whereas somebody that is very religious thinks it's unbelievably useful and practical to believe in God. Now, obviously, if you ask a believer in God why they believe in God, they're going to say because God's actually real and it's the truth and blah, blah, blah. They're not going to say, well, it's just useful for me to believe it, right? But James's whole point here was that we automatically kind of analyze the truth value of statements into what we do think is kind of uh, practical and useful for us to believe. So you believe in the religion that you believe in as opposed to other religions because there's something about that religion that to you is more useful and more practical. And people don't believe in religion at all if they don't see any way for that to be useful. So we can use pragmatism to defend these religious beliefs as well as to explain how we choose which one. I mean, a lot of it is maybe just you grew up with that being your cultural identity and your parents believed it and that's why you believe it. So we use pragmatism to talk about religion and to say that we choose religion, we have these beliefs, and we are free to choose these beliefs based on what's practically beneficial for us.